Chapter 32, Questions. Thank God for AIDS and the cure. You say, I thank God for AIDS and the cure. Could you elaborate? Not really, since God doesn't exist. Just because most people don't know exactly why the universe exists doesn't mean a God created everything. Besides, most re religions say that the soul or consciousness existed before the creation. Question is, how did we get inside this creation and why did we decide to come here in the first place? People can only think in physical terms and then call it a spiritual. It's the main reason why everybody attributes everything to a God because they don't really know why in reality. They only know the physical reality and physical explanations. And it's no coincidence that every religion throughout the whole of history does this no matter where they are on earth because people are naturally superstitious and when they don't know anything, they pass it off to some divine being or some sort of God. Then they call or claim that it's the only God without really seeking to understand the spiritual reality. And when they don't understand and pass it off into a God, it's the work of the devil or demons and the like. The idea of heaven and hell is only pleasing to the human because they think of the body and its physical senses instead of the soul. Think 1,000 virgins in paradise and the like. What makes people think that soul has a gender? Does the eternal soul need to procreate? Sex is a physical experience after all. So again, people can only think of spiritual things using physical comparisons. The cliche, as above, so below, is actually false. Believe me, they don't think of the soul because they don't know what it is. The fact that people talk about the soul like it's outside of themselves up to point uh, to a note, especially when it's talked about like everything else but themselves. Quote, you'll bury in hell for eternity, end quote. Point number one, for eternity to exist, there has to be no thing such as time and space. Point two, no physical matter lasts for eternity. Point three, if the soul or consciousness is incomparable, then how can it be burned? In fact, how can pain be felt when pain such as burning is only physical? Point number four, fire needs oxygen to burn. You don't even have to breathe or to have oxygen in your dream. So what makes people think it exists in heaven or hell? In fact, would it need to exist unless heaven or hell is a physical experience in reality? Point five, funny how people can only listen to the physical people who spread the so-called word of God or gospel to believe in the spiritual in the first place. You say God doesn't exist. God does exist, I'll prove it to you right here. Forget for a minute about every religion you've ever heard of and answer this question. Do you exist? Of course you do, and so do I. Therefore, God exists. God is the black person. There is no other God or gods. Black root science is the explanation of why this is true. Please read what I've presented so far and what will follow. Secondly, the statement, you'll burn in hell for eternity, was not made by me. Separate the words of various people accordingly. Thirdly, why do you say the statement as above, so below is false? Quote, God doesn't exist, end quote. I'd bet eternity on it. The universe is too mechanical for starters for there to be a being to have created it. Something exists, but certainly not a God, unless God is a system, of course, that has no consciousness or knows not the differences between good or bad, positive and negative, and love or hate. Whatever it is just exists and it functions far too perfectly and also has a cyclical nature to it. One thing I have noticed is that it does react to our own individual desires based upon what's in our subconscious. If we are negative or have lots of violent thoughts then somehow people of similar thinking are drawn to us or us to them. People call it attraction. Quote, God does exist. I'll prove it to you right here, end quote. No, you think you'll prove it. That's the problem, not knowing that you don't know at all. You can't physically or spiritually prove anything of this nature to anyone. No one can. You only listen and dismiss or listen and agree. People don't investigate things enough for themselves. If they did, they might discover something instead of being told something. Quote, forget for a minute about every religion you've ever heard and answer this question, end quote. My answer would be the same. I'm not the same as I was yesterday and I won't be the same tomorrow as I am today. There is just one constant, and that is my attention, which is focused in the now. Quote, do you exist? End quote. Naturally. Quote, of course you do, and so do I. End quote. Naturally. Quote, therefore, God exists. 
end quote. Interesting deduction. You can only base that on a physical assumption of a God. Children don't think about God or religion until life's experiences brings it into their path. The same goes for death. Quote, God is the black person. There is no other God or gods, end quote. Really? The truth is in the darkness, however. People are too addicted to the white light imagery of their minds, though. Like how moths fly into fire. Quote, black root science is the explanation of why this is true. Please read what I've presented so far and what will follow, end quote. I've read it already. Quote, why do you say the statement as above, so below is false, end quote. Because you're supposed to go within, not above. A lot easier when people stop thinking that the mind is the soul. The mind is in control of the soul or consciousness. Therefore, it gets led around a lot by the mind's constant thinking. It's supposed to be the other way around. People might stop talking about the soul as if it were an alien and separate from themselves. Then it's totally identified to being the mind though. That's why people are repetitive and develop habits of thinking and acting and speaking. The mind is supposed to be a tool, not your slave master. Do people really choose to feel bad about something, even something they might see on TV, or are they running on automatic, i.e. the habitual way of behaving? Depression is only habitual negative thinking, and that illness has only increased since the world has become more of a depressing place. People don't shed a tear about the events in the world, but they will if they read a book or see a film. If your soul is your attention, which doesn't change as you grow older, what do you think you're going to think about other than what's in the content of your mind? Only what you have learned in life, of course. Only the contents of your mind and body change as we grow older. The soul doesn't need to change if it's immortal. It shouldn't need to. It just doesn't know itself, so it can only recognize what's in the mind, which could be any old belief or theory to be frank about it, or any murderous or perverted feeling. The soul is totally absorbed in the mind. Frankly, at the moment, we're just going along for the ride, just like we are in a dream until we wake up. Until then, people are only as good or bad as what's in their subconscious minds controlling them. Sages have been saying, go within for eons, but people only thought they're talking about the mind. And things are so far gone now, it's all about the physical brain, which is a physical organ, which does nothing more other than to aid the mind and soul to express itself here in the flesh. Modern psychology is the worst religion on the planet. It limits people's scope of thinking. If the universe is too mechanical, why does that imply God didn't create it? It's like saying a car is too mechanical, therefore a man didn't create it. You say, quote unquote, something exists. I say not something, but you and me or black people. There is no one else at the beginning. You challenge the first statement leading to my proof by saying, I don't know that I don't know it all. This implies that you know that I don't know. If you have this capacity to know what I do and don't know, why can't I have the same capacity? I assert that we all have this capacity, therefore I do know it all. You call the conclusion of my proof an interesting deduction, meaning you disagree with the conclusion. Why do you disagree with error-free logic? If I say A equals B and B equals C, therefore A equals C, is this an interesting deduction? If I say I exist and therefore God exists because God is the black person, is this not error-free logic? Now, I'm not implying that you should agree with the last statement that God is the black person, but it's obvious to me that this is your only objection to my proof and not the logic in it. If you agree with this assessment, then we'll make this the basis of our argument. I'll restate it. God exists because God is the black person. Our argument, is God really the black person or is the black person really God? If I've properly defined the point of departure for our argument, please say so. If not, I'd like to hear your objection. That should, I think, be the main focus of our discussion. The last issue, as above, so below, is secondary at this point, and I'll address it briefly, but would not dwell on it for now. You object to going above and would rather go within. What's wrong with doing both? I can go above to the stars, either physically in a craft or in my imagination, and I can also go within into my consciousness. What's wrong with going above and within if I can do both? And since my analysis of the universe depends on going above to compare it to what's below, then I choose the one over the other in this case, 
and the other over the first in appropriate circumstances. Well, you say something exists. I say not something, but you and me or black people. There's no one else at the beginning, end quote. Other races exist too, you know, whether you like them or not. They exist for exactly the same reason ours does. Unfortunately, people aren't even looking for the reason. They don't desire it. Quote, you challenge the first statement leading to my proof by saying, I don't know that I don't know it at all. This implies that you know that I don't know, end quote. I know more than most when it comes to spirituality, so much that I hold back on most things because I know people won't understand. No point in talking about reincarnation, its purpose, and why people don't remember previous ones if you don't believe in it, is there? No, not at all. Plus, I have no intention to help people one bit with spiritual matters, not my bloody job to preach to people. And the way I see it, if you ain't seeking, you're not interested. Since people are only interested in the contents of their own minds. Quote, if you have this capacity to know what I do and don't know, why can't I have the same capacity? End quote. You can, but you're going about it the wrong way. Life is about experience after all, so it's not a major point. It's supposed to happen either way. Quote, I assert that we all have this capacity, therefore I do know it all. End quote. Actually, not all of us do at all. Not in this lifetime anyway. The fact that you don't know the differences between the mind or subconsciousness and the consciousness or soul says a lot. Know thyself has been said a lot too. Even that silly religion Scientology has grasped that point to a degree. But Mr. Hubbard got a bit too carried with the contents of his subconscious, as does everybody else I've noticed. Way too much fiction. The thing is, I know where it comes from, so I find it easy to identify. Quote, you call the conclusion of my proof an interesting deduction, meaning you disagree with the conclusion. Why do you disagree with error-free logic? End quote. It's devoid of logic. God is an emotional concept for starters. It doesn't even begin in logic, so how is it going to end in logic? And logic has its limit also, i.e. you can't understand something spiritual when you haven't had firsthand experience of the spiritual. Even worse, what people think is spiritual isn't actually for the most part. Quote, if I say A equals B and B equals C, therefore A equals C, is this an interesting deduction? And if I say God exists and therefore and if I say I exist and therefore God exists because God is the black person, is that not error-free logic, end quote. Again, it's not logic. You're fully identified to being a black person instead of an individual soul inside of a black form having a black experience. It's fine when it comes to material earthly matters, but it means squat when it comes to the so-called spiritual matters. Your body isn't going with you when you're dead. Buddha was close when he mentioned something about earthly attachments but even he got carried away with the doctrine of karma, which is also false. It's all about the physical world again. The soul isn't black or white, nor male or female. Quote, now I'm not implying that you should agree with the last statement that God is the black person, but it's obvious to me that this is your only objection to my proof and not the logic in it. Quote, I have no objections as to how and what you think is correct. Quote, if you agree with this assessment, then we'll make this the basis of our argument, end quote. I don't agree with you at all on any point whatsoever. Quote, I'll restate it, end quote. God exists because God is a black person, end quote. God is not a person. Spiritual assumptions based on material speculation won't get you far with me, I'm afraid. Our argument, is God really the black person or is the black person really God, end quote. Simple answer, no. Quote, if I've properly defined the point of departure for our argument, please say so. If not, I'd like to hear your objection. That should, I think, be the main focus of your discussion. The last issue, as above, so below, is secondary at this point, and I'll address it briefly, but will not dwell on it for now. You object to going above, and I would rather go within. What's wrong with doing both? I can go above to the stars, either physically in a craft or in my imagination, and I can also go within into my subconscious and my consciousness, end quote. No, you can't, since you are the consciousness. You can go inside into the mind, maybe which is the subconscious. A few occult practices and religions teach that. Hate to say it, but they're on the right track, but for the wrong reasons. But like I've said, going within has been misunderstood and will continue to be until people stop listening to other people and reading so-called spiritual books and actually get to work on it. No one said it would be easy. Quote, What's wrong with going above and within if I can do both, end quote. 
quote, since my analysis of the universe depends on going above to compare to what's below, then I choose one over the other in this case and the other over the first in appropriate circumstances, end quote. Going above is going without. You're doing it already, so no need to worry about that. Most people are doing the same. Since that's where yours and everybody else's goal is, the things of the earth, you can come back to what you know, as they say. Since you reject that God is the black person and quite emphatically with a single word, I'll put that aside for now. I want to look at some of your statements concerning the races, the reason for their existence, the soul, consciousness, and so on. Obviously, the non-Black races exist today. My statement is that they did not exist prior to some point in the past. You say they've existed at least as long as Black people have. Is that an accurate statement of your position? Then you say they exist for the same reason as Black people. What is that reason? Secondly, you say I can have the same capacity for knowledge that you have, but I go about it the wrong way. What is the right way? Third, you say the concept of God does not begin in logic, but is an emotional concept. My feeling for why you say this is that you recognize the emotional concept of God, but reject the logical truth of him. My goal in my writings is to make it clear that all those interested that God is not an emotional fabrication of our desire, by our, I mean Black people. The God of religion is indeed an emotional fabrication of minds that are not anchored in remote ancestral history. Only by following ancestral history to the very beginning will we know the first God, the one and only. This is a logical and clear-eyed process, not obscured by emotional immaturity. That is my way. It's a way taught to me by my ancestors and taught to them by the first gods at the beginning of the universe. Fourth, you say that I don't know the difference between the mind and the soul. Which statement in my writings caused you to come to this conclusion? Nonetheless, I'll define mind and soul. You say the mind is the subconscious and the soul is the consciousness. I differ. Consciousness and the subconscious are both the mind. One is unconscious or subconscious and the other is conscious. By mind, I do not mean the process of thinking, but consciousness itself. Those two aspects mean the mind is divided into two. The first is the unconscious mind, which is unconscious memory. The origin of unconscious memory or the unconscious mind or subconscious mind is our ancestors. It comes as a gift from them. So it's called ancestral memory. This type of memory enters every child at conception and is completely settled in the depth of his or her mind by the time of birth. The second type of mind is the awareness with which I am aware right now in the present. This is the conscious mind. The second type of mind forms what I'll call present derived memory as opposed to ancestral memory. This memory is responsible for the formation of the individual's personality. Every person interprets life events differently. This interpretation colors the memory that results from these events. This coloring forms the individual's unique personality. This unique personality is the soul of the individual. To summarize, the mind or consciousness is of two kinds. The first is the subconscious mind. It is simply the memory given to us as a gift by our ancestors. It contains all the life experiences of our lineage of ancestors all the way back to the first God who created our universe. The second is the conscious mind, our everyday awareness. From the second mind is formed the present time memory, which in turn forms the individual soul, which is personality. There is no such thing as an individual eternal soul in the sense that you imply. Every individual soul or personality is formed by him or her in the present life from experiences. What people call the eternal soul is actually our first self, the original God. This is not a soul. The first self is not anything that can be described, yet he or she is the source of all things. Now, even though there is no eternal individual soul, there is something eternal in every individual. It's the unconscious mind, which is the unconscious only in individuals, but is conscious in the 24 elders. This mind, ancestral memory, comes from eternity that has no beginning. It's called the mind of God and lives in every black person. Well, obviously the non-black races exist today. 
My statement is that they did not exist prior to some point in past. You say they've existed at least as long as black people have. Is that an accurate statement on your position? Then you say they exist for the same reason as black people. What is that reason? End quote. You see, this is why I keep race and spirituality well far apart. They have nothing at all to do with each as far as I'm concerned. As a race, no, the non-black races haven't existed as long, but the consciousness and the non-black races have. Consciousness doesn't just pop out of thin air once you're born. And if everybody realized that they are the consciousness inside the body first and foremost, and I mean everybody, then I doubt this earth would have so many problems. Certainly not with race as it's a temporary thing anyway with being human really. But people are so addicted and fully identified with the body and brain, then this is what we get. Life as it is now. Because people don't know themselves. People say embrace diversity while thinking that the same way someone may look makes them think differently. Yet even thinking comes from within the mind. But no, they just see a face and it's race. How many adverts do you see on TV telling you how to improve your thinking or behavior? Absolutely none. You know why? Because they don't want us to improve as people. Quote, secondly, you say I can have the same capacity for knowledge that you have, but I go about it in the wrong way. What is the right way? End quote. As I've said, going within and awakening the self. Not going to say any more than that since it would take ages and probably a whole website when I think about it. Quote, third, you say the concept of God does not begin in logic, but is an emotional concept. My feeling for why you say this is that you recognize the emotional concept of God, but reject the logical truth of him, end quote. I reject it for a reason. I know better than that. Quote, my goal in my writings is to make it clear to all those interested that God is not an emotional fabrication of our desire. By our, I mean black people. The God of religion is indeed an emotional fabrication of minds that are not anchored in remote ancestral history. Only by following ancestral history to the very beginning will we know the first God, the one and only. This is a logical and clear-eyed process, not obscured by emotional immaturity. That is my way. It's a way taught to me by my ancestors and taught to them by the first gods at the beginning of the universe. Fourth, you say that I don't know the difference between the mind and the soul. Which statement in my writings caused you to come to this conclusion? Nonetheless, I'll define mind and soul. You say the mind is subconscious and the soul is consciousness. I defer. End quote. Then you're wrong. Simple as. And you make the same mistakes as everybody else, i.e. worship of the body and mind. Subject closed as far as I'm concerned. Quote. There is no such thing as an individual eternal soul. Every individual soul or personality is formed by him or her in the present from life experiences, end quote. Then even Christians, Muslims, and the rest are closer to the truth than you are. You're rejecting free will for starters, which comes from the consciousness, not the subconscious. The subconscious influences our thinking, however, the same way it gives us our memory and emotions. The subconscious doesn't discriminate between good or evil. It will pop any type of thought for the consciousness to either accept or reject. Those who haven't developed their consciousness to a certain degree will act out any fantasy given to it by the subconscious, like we all do in a dream. It's the same mind, so why isn't it doing it now? That's right, you think you're fully awake. Quote, now even though there is no eternal individual soul, there is something eternal in every individual. It's the unconscious mind, which is unconscious only in individuals, but is conscious in the 24 elders. This mind or ancestral memory comes from eternity that has no beginning. It's called the mind of God and lives in every black person, end quote. That is false. It's not eternal for starters. Very old, but very far from eternal. It's connected to the human mind and is sometimes called the collective unconscious. It's nothing more than a sea of imagination, which people sometimes call good, God, or as you call it, the 24 elders, and as others have called it, Satan or Mother Condolini. It would help if people knew how it actually operated, then people would stop giving it stupid names. As you think it will give, and it operates on the individual's desire, rather than the desire, whether that desire is good or evil, and it won't help you either, certainly not with spiritual matters. It has a purpose and a function, which is to bring people the experiences they need and desire. Like attracts like. That's all I've got to say on the subject. No point in wasting my time with someone who doesn't even recognize that their own attention is their consciousness. It's so absorbed in the mind contents that it's pretty much in a daydream. 
acting out its fantasies totally oblivious to the world around them. Never mind, way too many religions and spiritual beliefs on this earth in the first place for it not to be the fantasy of someone's mind. Why do you think they exist in the first place? If a pure conscious or alpha consciousness puts a virtual reality helmet on it, would take everything it sees for real too and lose all identity of self. This is why we have a mind and a body to learn the experience things many times over if need be until we actually desire to get it right and leave. Right now, the mind is self to most people. Actually, most people don't even think about these things which says a lot since we're all amused and distracted by this amusement park experience. You wrote, quote, that's all I've got to say on the subject. No point wasting my time with someone who doesn't even recognize that their own attention is their consciousness, end quote. Very well, I'll be ready to continue when it's no longer a waste of your time. Mr. Intrigue, to my knowledge, Mr. Muhammad never taught that Blacks existed before the creation of Earth. If he did, please present evidence. If he did not, are you stating he was incorrect? As you read my post, you'll find many things in them that Elijah Muhammad did not mention. This should not surprise you, considering my explanation of how I learned this knowledge. Now, your question above contains a logical contradiction which comes as a result of a lack of understanding of Elijah's teaching. He clearly taught that, quote, the original man is none other than the black man. The black man and woman is the first and last creator and owner of the universe, end quote. From Message to the Black Man, chapter 29. If Blacks did not exist before the creation of the earth, how did they create it? You also ask, quote, why do I use Elijah's statements to support my own, end quote. The reason is because truth supports truth. I use statements from anyone and everyone that I judge to be true. This is the most effective way to communicate written and spoken truth. There is another kind of truth called absolute truth, which needs no external support. But as long as Black people are still excluded by their own choice from the rights and methods of initiation that leads to absolute truth, I'll continue to use this method. When the natural way of learning of our people comes back into use, then every individual will know the truth directly without, inter without any intermediary. Until then, the truth will remain relative to them and secondhand at best. So I'll continue to support it by external means. But sir, Mr. Muhammad's quote did not support yours. Yes, Elijah's statements do support my statement that black people existed before the creation of earth. Look at it logically. In the I-40 lessons, he says, who is the original man? Answer, the original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet earth, father of civilization and God of the universe. Clearly, if the black man is the maker and God of the universe, he existed before the universe he created. Otherwise, how could he create it? It seems that your objection is that other black people did not exist before the creation of the earth, but only one black man, Allah, existed. It seems you also think that this black man, Allah, has existed continuously since the beginning and is the same today. This is a gross misunderstanding of who God is. Elijah made it clear that the 24 elders select one among them every 25,000 years. And this one is called God, Allah. He or she dies and ascends after some time and a new God, Allah, takes his or her place and on and on. It has been going on since the creation of our universe. Thus, there is no single man called God who lives continuously forever in the way you think. The question then is, who is Allah? Clearly, he is a black man, as Elijah says. But which black man? And is it only one black man? Elijah answers this in the Theology of Time, book two, where he says, quote, who is Allah? I am Allah. You are Allah. We are all Allah, end quote. That means all black people are Allah and only black people because the other races did not exist then. They came out of the black man. Now, I came upon my knowledge independently before I heard of Elijah Muhammad. When I came upon his teachings and saw that they were true, I used them because I'm communicating with people 
who are somewhat familiar with them, but there is much more that he never revealed. So you'll find many statements in my post that he never said. Do not take the sum total of Elijah's publications and speeches as the complete standard by which to measure the truth. Those who were close to him know that there were certain things he revealed only to them and never made public. So do not measure my statements by whether or not they are included in Elijah's teachings. If you do that, you'll raise your own stumbling block and fail to understand the greater truth. Quote, you might ask, who is this tribe of Shabazz? Originally, they were the tribe that came with the earth or this part 66 trillion years ago when a great explosion on our planet divided it into two parts. One we call earth and the other moon, end quote. Excerpt of message to the black man by Mr. Muhammad. If you are correct, this statement would be contradictory. Quote, they were the tribe that came with the earth or this part 66 trillion years ago, end quote. This statement does not mean that the earth began 66 trillion years ago. It also does not mean that there were no people on it prior to that time. All it means is that 66 trillion years ago, the moon was separated from the earth. A certain group of our people were on, were on that larger part that remained as the earth. It's, it is this group that Elijah refers to as Shabazz. Now he makes the mistake of saying Shabazz is a tribe. That is not so. The word Shabazz means nation, not tribe. The nation has 12 tribes. This word comes from the ancient word Shaba or Shaba, as we say today in my language. Says Shaba, it means nation. Therefore, Shabazz is the entire black nation. Please read more about this incident of separating the moon. You'll see that Elijah weaves a story that he says led to the incident. He says that a certain scientist was displeased with the fact that there were 12 different languages on earth. He wanted to have only one language. When he could not achieve this, he became angry and blew up the earth with a large bomb, causing part of it to separate and become the moon. This story is only a legend to illustrate the separation of the moon from the earth. It did not happen that way. But the point is that there were 12, were black people already on earth. They had been living here for over 12 trillion years before the moon separated. Therefore, the entire black nation or Shabazz did not come with the earth 66 trillion years ago, as that statement seems to imply when taken out of context. I urge you to read the rest of what he said on this topic. You further answered me by saying, in the sense that the creator was black, this is true. Two, more than one person is not meant. Three, the supreme being is not being referred to when it is said, you are Allah. Your first statement is correct. Your second statement is correct in the sense that at the end of the universe, all people unite as one person. This one person is the true absolute God, yet he lives in many people united as one. Your third statement is incorrect. You imply that there is another supreme being outside of the black man or woman, just such as you and me. There is no supreme being outside of the black man or woman. By trying to separate the supreme being from the ordinary black man or woman, you fall into the trap laid by all the religions of the non-black races, including white Islam. The trap is that there is some supreme being somewhere who is separate from you and me as black people. This is the greatest lie of the devils. It removes power from where power belongs and transfers it to some father figure outside of yourself in some non-existent place that nobody knows where. It even goes further and implies that since this supreme being is separate from us and our ancestors, that he most likely is some spook or spirit being. There is no such being or God. The only God there is, is incarnated as you and me. But you are presently unaware that you are the supreme being that you seek far away. The reason you are unaware is because you have yet to experience divine unity with your higher self. When the time comes and you experience it, you'll know without a shadow of a doubt that there is no supreme being. There is only you and your natural perfection divided into endless trillions of personalities. Do you believe everything stated by Mr. Malaysia Ahmed was correct or not? It's not possible for Elijah Muhammad, myself, you or God to speak or write the full truth. 
It's simply impossible. Even using our ancient language, which is so perfect that it admits of no misinterpretation. The reason for this is because God designed the universe to be a place of experience. So the full correct truth can only be known by direct personal experience. All written and spoken truth is a guide, a path to be used to comfort and encourage as long as those hearing it are not in a position to experience the truth directly. So how can the full truth be experienced directly? Through the rites of initiation established for us by the 1 billion, 8 million original people at the beginning of the universe. These rites lead a person into the past where he or she can relive the truth directly. There is no other way, past, present, or future. This way set by the original gods is the only way to full truth. Mr. Muhammad stated, God appeared in the person of Mr. Farn. Sir, in your opinion, did God appear in the person of Mr. Fard Muhammad? Yes, and he also appeared in the person of Elijah Muhammad. Not only that, but he is appearing right now in your person. The only difference between you and Fard is that he was aware of it, whereas you have yet to be aware. FYI, Mr. Muhammad specifically mentioned God appearing in the person of Master Fard. What have you stated? is partially true. Mr. Muhammad stated that Mr. Fard was the Supreme Being. Do you believe that? No, and it's not a matter of belief. I know that he is not the Supreme Being in the way you think. The Supreme Being is the divine unity of all Black people, the one and only true God. Any Black person who reaches that indescribable state knows himself or herself as the one and only Supreme Being although in that state there is no one else. So there was no one ever, so there is no one over whom you could be supreme. How do you explain the similarities? 24 elders, 6,000 years, 78 trillion years, Yaqub, et cetera, expelled exactly as Mr. Muhammad did, Y-A-K-U-B. Why are your teachings similar to Mr. Muhammad's teachings? He has taught the basis of some of your info since the early 1930s. Now, someone has obviously stolen info from someone. Why do you expect true information to be different? Why are you surprised that I mentioned the 24 elders, 6,000 years, etc.? This information is true, regardless of who it comes from. Do you know that these are the same 24 elders mentioned in the book of Revelations of the Exian Bible? Elijah and Far did not invent this info in 1930. It has been true for 6,000 years and more. Where do you think Fard got his knowledge? He was trained and initiated by the elders of his own tribe, of which his father, a black man, was one. This knowledge has been passed from generation to generation for thousands of years. Before Elijah and Fard, there were others who were also initiated into this knowledge many others to ensure that this knowledge never dies. So don't be surprised that there are others who know. In the near future, many other Africans like myself are going to be allowed to come into the open. Do not make the mistake of rejecting them when they do because you'll reject vital information that is crucial to overcome the deceptions of the coming false Messiah. I don't derive my knowledge from the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. Instead, I base my discussions on his teachings for two reasons. They are the most accurate representation of the truth in the West. They're relatively well known and so provide a perfect launching pad for the larger truth. Knowledge as it is taught in Africa is somewhat different than some of Elijah's teachings. Read some of my posts on numbers, chemistry, biology, the Trinity, and so on to get an idea of what is taught in our initiations. Elijah taught a bit differently. This is not to say he was misguided. Rather, he tempered his teachings to accommodate the minds of his students. Today, many Black people are much more sophisticated in their thinking and can grasp the larger truth more so than was possible in Elijah's time, at least until the time of his death. This has been made possible by widespread education and literacy, especially since the advent of the internet. People may think that the internet was invented for the sole purpose of advancing the civilization of the non-Black races as they claim. Not so. 
The primary purpose for the invention of the internet was to make it possible to reach many black people here in America and the West and to a lesser extent in Africa. The fact that mostly white people were responsible for its invention is neither here nor there. Properly speaking, the singular most important idea that finally made it possible for the internet to take off had to do with large scale parallel processing of data or so-called supercomputing and was invented by a Nigerian man. But it's not important how technology comes about. What is important is its use. It made information easily available to many Black people. The powers responsible for this age will use whatever means are convenient to achieve their goal. I'm speaking here of Yahweh and the Elohim. Their goal is to awaken Black people from 6,000 years of slumber. In Elijah's time, such mass scale availability of information was not possible. So people of that era, generally speaking, were not as ready as people are today to know the greater truth. For that reason, Elijah held back on many things and taught in a way that made it easy for the masses to digest what he said. It's a case of feeding milk to babies, so to speak. But today, Black people are far more mentally mature, thanks partly to worldwide television, radio, and the internet. As I pointed out before, all things in the world are a reflection of what is inside us. When the time is ready, we project it outward, and this results in so-called modern inventions. It's not important in this respect as to who receives the information or the inspiration to make it real. The result is the same, namely the expansion of the mind so people can understand the larger truth. And that larger truth is this, God is incarnated in you, black one. You are God incarnated as a new person. There is no truth greater than this. But Elijah could not teach this to the masses of his followers in the beginning because he was dealing with babes, as I said, who were hearing this for the first time. Them having not yet developed mental teeth, he cannot feed them meat, but only milk. That's the reason he gave them a representation of God in the person of Far Muhammad, his teacher. Who else to present as God than the man he revered the most? Now this teaching is not a lie. Fard was conscious of his first self. Any person who comes into conscious contact with his or her first self cannot help but know that he or she is the incarnation of the one and only true God. But at the end of his life, Elijah began to suggest to them that the greater truth is greater than the person of Fard and said most emphatically to them all, quote, you are Allah. End quote. About your other posts, the ones by Mr. True Islam. These are a mixture of truths and falsehoods. As they say, Elijah Muhammad would be turning in his grave if he could see some of these quotes you put here. They carelessly mix some of his true teachings with the falsehoods of white people. These lies, notably those about Shambhala, Shangri-La, Agartha, the Masters of Destiny, Dervish Order, Lords of Souls, Godmen, the hierarchy, the great white brotherhood, the hidden directorate, the golden dawn, Brahatma, the Tibetan lies coming from the monks, lamas, the Dalai Lama, the goros or gurus, the so-called adepts, and on and on. All these falsehoods and deceptions come from the perverted imaginations of mainly two groups. Both were started thousands of years ago and survive today in a modified form under the, under the two names of Theosophists and their arch enemies called Rosicrucians. The first is made up mostly of Semites and Yellow Asians. The second, Rosicrucians, is made up mostly of Caucasians. The so-called godmen they worship are not the 24 elders. Do you really think white men in secret societies would worship black people? These two these two secret societies are fighting for control of the world before the appearance of the true king of this age, Yahweh. Both groups have for millennia been preparing all this nonsensical and useless mysticism that is reflected in some of the material you cut and pasted here. They intend to prepare the world through these lies for the appearance of their false Messiah, a white man, part Semitic, part Caucasian, who they will claim as the expected king of the world. It's all a well-fabricated deception. I'll try and make it understandable to the layperson by going back to the very beginning of these secret societies and show how and where they originated. 
I'll do that in a series of posts in the near future. For now, I intend to start a discussion on the true Israelites, as this is more important. When I finish, hopefully in a few weeks, then I'll address your quotes and separate some of Elijah's teachings from the chaff mixed in with it by the people you quote, such as Samuel Mathers, Manly Hall, and other deceivers who spew this kind of venom to promote their evil masters. Quote, oh, he or she dies and ascends after some time. Quote, ascending to where? All people who die ascend to the minds of the 24 elders. They are the custodians of divine unity, a state of mind that has been called eternity by some who have experienced it and heaven by others. All personalities without exception ascend to this heaven when they die. Personalities cannot be destroyed. They remain in the minds of all who ever had interactions with them. You can see this for yourself from the fact that even though you no longer see some of your childhood friends, yet they remain alive in your mind because now and then you dream about them. That is how personalities are preserved forever. Now, the mind of an ordinary individual is imperfect, especially in this age when initiation rites are no longer used as public education to improve the mind. But the minds of the 24 elders remain perfect forever. Therefore, they have in their minds all the personalities that have ever lived on earth since its creation. In the same way that your dream personalities are independent and act independently in your dreams, so too do all personalities regain their independence and self-consciousness after ascending into the minds of the elders. The difference is that whereas your dreams are unconscious, the elders' heavens are not dreams at all, but a wide awake reality, much more so than this reality in which we live today. That is what ascension means. Therefore, heaven exists in the minds of the 24 elders until the end of the universe, when all people will unite as one. That is the meaning of the statement that God is one. This is so only in the state of divine unity. Personally, I think anyone who bases their spirituality around race issues is lying and manipulating people. Our spirituality is not based on race. Race is incidental to it. It's like this. Black people have been alive on earth and in the universe for countless trillions of years. About 6,000 years ago, the other races suddenly appeared. The vast majority of our ancestors know nothing about them. They lived at a time when there were no races. Our minds today are colored with the concept of race because we live in racial times. Imagine countless trillions of other people who lived at different times when races were entirely unknown. They were the only quote race, unquote, on earth, but they didn't call themselves a race, how could they? The concept of race is relative and depends on the existence of the other races. If other races don't exist and our people are the only people, how could they even conceive of the idea of race? The knowledge of our ancestors, our spirituality comes from afar, far distant times. So far that it's impossible for people to comprehend just how ancient it is. This knowledge is set in stone, so to speak. It's like a wise old man who is set in his ways. It cannot be changed by something as temporary as race, which has a lifespan of only 7,000 years. Such a short span is nothing compared to the 78 trillion years of our Earth's history. To say that our spirituality, our knowledge is based on race is to have a short-sighted view of our true history. If you could only see the panorama of our history laid out in front of you, the way it appears to me, then you'd see clearly that this racial period we live in is so short as to be insignificant. It accounts for nothing in the larger scheme of our knowledge. When I stress repeatedly that God is black, this is not a racial statement. It's a statement designed to try and awaken people to the fact that from the eternal point of view, or even from the point of view of 78 trillion years of our earth's history, black people are the only people there are. The other races will just pass away as surely as many other species have come and gone on earth. They'll go the way of the ancient dinosaurs, but black people will always be here as we've been since the beginning. The reason God is black is because the black color contains 
all other colors in itself. It's the only one like that. God needs all the colors inside the black germ to give color to plants and animals and all of nature. This is a purely natural fact, not at all racial. There's no way to say this today without sounding racist, even though that's not the intent, but be that as it may. I have just spent an hour and a half reading this post. Very interesting, but it has many similarities between different teachings of the five percenters, the nation of Islam, the house of David, all of which have no real true evidential basis or truth in my honest opinion. Another question is why these sciences were lost for so many centuries and only now the truth has only emerged in the last couple of decades. If all the sciences were true, why is it that black people are in the situation they are in now? Why are they the, not the kings and queens as the sciences predicted they would be? I'm sorry if I am being pessimistic about all of this, but it just seems to me this black root science has just been made up using a mix of mesh of different legends and stories from the Middle East and the Bible, Quran, Torah. I just wonder why, if this was all true, would the non-black races be more populous than the black race as India and China already are two six of the world population? Like I said, just my opinion. Yes, there's similarity to 5% in Nation of Islam, the Nation of Islam of Elijah Muhammad, not the modern version. The reason is because what Elijah taught is the best approximation of the truth ever revealed in America. 5% is also on target as an evolution of Elijah's teachings. They've taken it to a higher level by teaching that every black man is God, not just Fard Muhammad. Where they make a mistake is by saying the black woman is less than the man. The truth is that the woman is the man's complement, just as the man is her complement. Neither one is complete without the other. Other than that, 5% is by far the most advanced system of truth since the death of Elijah. You make the mistake made by most learned black people when you seek intellectual evidence. The only true evidence of anything is direct personal experience. Whatever other evidence one can find can be turned upside down by anyone with a clever mind for debating. So external evidence cannot replace direct experience as the final arbiter and judge of the truth. How does one get direct experience of spiritual matters? There are different ways. The best way is by listening to your conscience, the voice of your higher self. He or she is the only one who knows the full truth. You can practice listening to your higher self by doing the mental exercise I gave before. Diligent practice will eventually answer your quest for real evidence. On the question of why it took 6,000 years for this knowledge to surface, that's not really accurate. The knowledge has been revealed six times before Elijah, about once every 1,000 years. But because the devils rule the world, they corrupt it, challenge it, call it lies, denigrate it, and do everything they can to turn black people away from it. So every time it has to be revealed anew, as Elijah has done. It must be that way because it's the devil's destiny to rule the world for 6,000 years. This is preordained and written in stone by the elders whose will is the will of the 1 billion, 8 million original gods. Therefore, black people had to be oppressed for 6,000 years to fulfill the destiny. We chose it. We chose for it to be like that for the sake of experience. The fact that what I say in my lessons contains legends from other people and ancient scripts should not be a reason to reject it. That logic would have us rejecting mathematical truths, for example, simply because someone else mentioned them before us. Obviously, this is faulty logic. Don't reject it because you've heard it before or because someone said it before me. Reject it only if your conscience tells you it's untrue. I'm considered by my teachers, my elders, to be an unsurpassed summator of facts. I have a natural ability to collect disparate facts and bring them together to illustrate a higher truth. This is not self-praise. I was trained that way since childhood because of a natural talent that those who knew recognized in me. Now, I could have tried to teach these lessons the way they are taught in Africa, but that would have required that I define many new concepts that are totally foreign to the Western minds of our people here. 
such a task would be beyond my means. And even then it's doubtful if there would be a real understanding. As it is, Elijah laid a solid foundation and I use it to advantage and why not? Some call this stealing or lying, etc. They use the white man's standards and method which lay claim to the truth as intellectual property. In my culture, we know that truth belongs to no one person. Anyone who speaks the truth does so by inspiration and should thank God for it, meaning the higher self. White people lacking a higher self claim the truth as personal property. This is an affront to God, even to their collective mind, the mind of Yahweh. The divine unity we call God is the only true owner of the truth, which is like sunlight. It does not belong to any one person. So if this is stealing, then I'm happy to steal anything and everything that I can use to cause the light to shine in our people the way it was caused to shine in me. The light of truth cannot be held back. It must be shared. When enough people receive it, a minimum of 144,000, then the present cycle will end along with the rule of the non-Blacks and all our suffering. Quote, where they make a mistake is by saying the Black woman is less than a man, end quote. Won't you please provide proof? The 5% is also called the nation of gods and earths. They teach that the man is God and the woman is earth. To the common sense, earth is less than God. Therefore, they imply that women are less than men. The fact that women have different roles than men should not imply superiority. This is good then. If they mean that men and women are equal in spirit and only different in roles, then I applaud them. Quote, so external evidence cannot replace direct experience as the final arbiter and judge of the truth, end quote. But what if no direct experience is to be had? What then? One keeps practicing until communion with the self is achieved. That will provide direct experience. That's what our ritual system of education is for. But for those now divorced from rituals, there are other spiritual exercises, such as the one I gave. In the case of historical matters, what you suggest is, mo is not relevant. Sure it is. All things come from the mind or spirit and can be investigated without regard to artificial classifications, such as historical. The mind makes no such distinctions. The only requirement is for one to make contact with the first self who then takes care of it. So are you suggesting by mere meditation, I may divine events of the past? Definitely not. The idea is to make contact with the first self. Simply meditating won't do it. After contact, there is no divining involved. The first self has experienced all and can lead you to any part of it. Shall the first self inform me there was World War I and World War II? Of course. God can inform you on any topic whatsoever. Intrigue. I have been checking out your post for some time now, and I have a few questions for you, if you don't mind. So this is what you come up with to answers to the reasons for all of the horrible things that white folks do to black people. What difference does any of it make if you are not aware of it? Like you're saying we are really some God re in gods reincarnated. Anybody could say whatever if they expect someone to believe something that happened before they were born or, for, or if it happened after they were dead. How could we ever know? How does this information supposed to help us deal with all the madness going on now? So is this same as what the Christians say about suffer here on earth and get your rewards in some far off place called heaven after you die? I mean, what you say sounds nice and encouraging. Maybe that's the purpose of all this is for us to feel as though there will be something for us because we have to deal with all this craziness. Hopefully you'll let me know something. The fact that we black people are gods is not a feel good thing. Neither is it a religion or a delayed promise that cannot be realized until we reach heaven. It's an absolute reality. It's the most real and true thing in the whole universe. Try and imagine God forgetting who he or she is. That's the situation we are in today and have been for 6,000 years. I assure you that this is a condition we chose to experience regardless of how else it seems in our daily lives. 
What causes most of our suffering is not the actual acts of evil that never seem to stop coming our way. It's really caused by the fact that we have forgotten who we are. If we could remember, and genuinely so, the suffering would only amount to experiences that we could take in stride, never missing a beat. But I admit, this is hard to do. For now, does it not make sense for us to learn as much as we can about who we are, how we came to be in this situation, and what is to be the end result of it? It may cause intense emotional pain at first to learn that, at a deeper level, God caused his or her own suffering. But isn't this knowledge way more empowering than to believe that we are at the mercy of whites and they have more power than we? That's my purpose, to remind Black people that we are the architects of our own experiences. We are not under the mercy of anyone or anything. There is no being or thing more powerful than you. These should be empowering words, my sister. This power belongs to you and is still in you, even though you have forgotten it. With regard to melanin and natural morality, many Blacks participate in this day and age in the West, perhaps other places, in many forms of immor immorality, watching porn, adultery, lying, some sex activities, murder, stealing, etc., and are in possession of large quantities of melanin. At the same time, let's just say hypothetically, since I can't necessarily give any definite examples, some, probably very few, whites do not participate in such activities and live a pretty moral life. If whites are naturally evil because of the absence of the brown germ, which I believe is true by the way, what is the difference between blacks committing various perversions or so-called sins, full behavior and whites committing the same? Are there different consequences for the two? And if there are or aren't, what are the ultimate consequences of a sinful life, i.e. watching porn, premarital sex, adultery, etc.? in terms of what happens to us after we leave this place and join the 24 elders or go to the various places within the mind of God. Basically, do black sinners or participants in morality, immorality go to hell with or without white people or is hell just a myth? Will there be a judgment of the non-believers? And what is a believer defined as? Please explain. Black people made a decision when they created the universe that part of its purpose would be to manifest what we call evil. To do this, the gods decided to make a man in our image who would be evil by nature. In addition, they deteriorated their bodies to the state that we are in today. The non-Black races called devils in ancient scriptures were made 6,000 years ago from these bodies by the process I've, I've outlined before. Prior to that time, evil was impossible to manifest on earth. For evil to appear, there must be a self-forgetfulness. So black people brought themselves into a state of deep self-forgetfulness. And from that state of ignorance, they made the devils. Still, the black people who made them could not originate evil by themselves. Even though they were in a deep state of self-forgetfulness, even as we are today, they were not evil by nature. Evil acts can only be originated by people who are evil by nature because of the way they were made by removing the black germ, the seed of morality. Black people still have the black germ even in our state of complete self-forgetfulness. Now, evil started to manifest on earth as soon as the devils were born. They took their evil acts, perversions and deceptions into the peaceful societies of our ancestors of that time. Over a period of many centuries and eventually many millennia, they managed to corrupt these black people to such an extent that they too began to act in evil ways. This was possible because of our state of self-forgetfulness. In that state, an influential evil person can cause a peaceful person to imitate him. This is a universal occurrence that can be observed even today. Look at any African or other indigenous society before contact with the West. Then look at them again after such contact. More often than not, you'll soon see that our people began to imitate their evil behavior of non-Blacks. Women who were upright and decent soon began to imitate the indecency of white women. They're forced into this behavior when they notice that their men are attracted to such indecent non-Black women. So they imitate these women to try and regain their men's attention. Why are some Black men attracted to the indecency and immorality exhibited by these immoral light race women because they in turn are imitating white men who are naturally attracted to such indecency. 
Black men who fall into this trap believe they can become powerful and influential like white men if they can be seen with the kind of women that white men find attractive. Soon it becomes a domino effect. Other Black people begin to imitate their westernized brothers and sisters, and before long, entire societies are changed and corrupted. Where before there was peace, there is now jealousies, violence, fornication, homosexuality, and every other foul, evil act imaginable. Black people, being naturally more imaginative than the non-Black races, will even take their imitation of evil behavior to an extreme, outdoing the mothers and fathers of evil themselves, in which case you'll hear the devil say, see, Black people are naturally more evil than we are, exactly as they are saying today about the behavior of some Black people caught in the desperate devastation of New Orleans. Imitation caused by deception is the main cause of sin among Black people, but it leads to secondary causes such as vengeance, resentment, frustration, feeling slighted, oppressed, abused, or taken advantage of. But think back to the original cause and ask yourself, were there murders, rapes, fornications, deceptions, and other full-scale evil acts among Black societies before the appearance of non-Blacks? The answer is an emphatic no. You can confirm this for yourself by reading the writings of the whites themselves. There are white and Arab travelers who have written about Black socialites, Black societies in Africa during the Middle Ages and before. They were all unfailingly impressed by the high morality of our ancestors. Some of them admit that after, only after contact with non-Blacks did Black societies lose their naturally high moral standards. So now here we are 6,000 years later, we have arrived at a time when all evil that has been over that has overtaken the world must be reversed in order to restore nature's balance. This means the devils and their descendants must reverse the harm of every single evil act or thought they've ever had in the last 6,000 years. The world will not regain its full and perfect balance until those who caused it through their actions and thoughts have corrected every single imbalance no matter how large or small. To properly correct anything, the only correct way is to go to the first cause. The punishment of evildoers is nature's job. Nature's laws are impersonal. Nature only looks at the first cause and goes directly to it. So the question becomes, what is the cause of the evil acts performed by Black people? The undeniable, demonstrable, or demonstrable, an easily verifiable fact is that Black people did not know evil until it was introduced to them by non-Blacks. If a child imitates the evil acts of his or her parents, who is to blame? If the child gets into the habit of evil acts because of the imitation and grows into an adult evildoer, who is to blame? In both cases, the parents are to blame, even after he or she has become an adult. One may make a logical analysis and conclude that as an adult, he or she should know right from wrong. That's true, but easier said than done. It's difficult to reverse years of habitual behavior, especially if the habits were inculcated in childhood. Those are the hardest to erase, erase or correct, especially in non-supportive communities such as today's. Now, I'm not implying that Black people are children. On the contrary, we are infinitely more ancient than the non-Blacks. But our state of self-forgetfulness has put us in a vulnerable position as a people, where we are easily influenced by the appearance of false power. The devils, especially whites, appear to us to have a lot of power. The average Black person, mired as we are in lack of knowledge of self, is easily influenced by this apparent power. That's the reason why some so-called progressive Blacks want to assimilate and integrate with their very enemies. They're blinded by the false artificial power wielded by whites. As far as nature is concerned, temporary artificial causes of such evil, such as imitation, do not count. Nature strips all false appearances and facades and goes straight to the roots. And she says, who caused the imbalance in me? The devils did. So I'll punish and remove them. And that will be that. Nature cannot be distracted by any detours, deceptions, logical explanations or machinations of any kind that try to make her look away from first causes. She looks straight at it and removes it without hesitation or regret. So the ultimate answer to your question of whether black people will be punished for their sins by being sent to hell is simply no. 
the great judge will simply overlook them in her direct march to the cause of their behavior, which is cl as clear to her as the sun shines. In Yahweh's heavens, such punishment is self-imposed as part of a natural law. People there will be in a state of mind where nothing can be hidden. All their intentions and those of their forefathers will be clearly visible to everyone. Their evil natures will be totally exposed. Their natures will compel them to, to place themselves in the appropriate sections of heaven. Some of these sections are occupied by such foul and debased people, they are called hell. As I mentioned before, the heavens of Yahweh range from the lowest and most foul to the highest and most glorious. The hellish conditions in the lowest of these heavens are so severe that most of the inhabitants have very little chance of accepting salvation and everlasting life. Many of them will perish and die in the second and final death from which there is no resurrection. Please think about these words, brother, and see whether or not there is truth in them that explains why some black people cannot commit sins and why they cannot possibly be punished by being sent to hell along with the rest of the wise and fair judge who knows the true causes of all things. I want to ask you a few questions if that's cool. I was wondering about the white folks and their purpose. If their purpose is to show the evil side of God or the self forgetfulness, why do black people need to be here? And how can black people be self forgetful and not be evil as well? being that you use birth, both words to mean the same thing. Are black people evil in this cycle being that they have self-forgetfulness? I recall that you said that if someone was to dilute the black race on purpose, that they shall be punished. And on another post, someone asked you if blacks committing sinful acts, will they be punished? And this is what you said, quote, please think about these words, brother and see whether or not there is truth in them that explains why some black people commit sins and why they cannot possibly be punished by being sent to hell along with the rest by the wise and fair judge who knows the true causes of all things, end quote. Is there a difference? If being evil is their nature, the whites, then how can they repent being that this is the whole purpose of their creation? Is that not similar to a tiger apologizing for its stripes and blaming a lion for eating antelopes? Wouldn't that just be the way that they were made? Wouldn't it make more sense for the whites to live out their purpose and then it ends and they just disappear, being that you said that they were not here prior to 6,000 years ago? You make it seem as if white folks have a choice about their lack of morality, like they can change that they were born absent of the black germ. If it is true that white folks are here for the purpose in which you state, wouldn't that be enough needed to experience self-forgetfulness? Once again, I don't understand why Black people have to be here and live in the same state that white folks are, in a state of self-forgetfulness or evil, since we are the ones that created them. Why do we have to live among them? I hope these questions that I have asked make sense. It kind of sounds like I'm rambling. So I'll stop here and hope that you get what I'm asking. Thanks again. I get the sense that your most pertinent question is why black people have to be here for this evil experience since we already created whites for that purpose. So I'll answer it last. First then your question is, how can black people be self forgetful and not be evil given that evil and self forgetfulness mean one and the same? Black people can be evil. By evil, we mean doing evil acts. We do them as you well know. Black people commit murders, rape, steal, etc. So we can be and are evil just like the non-Blacks, but we cannot be punished for it, it's impossible. When I said that the non-Black races will be punished by being sent to hell, I was oversimplifying. In truth, no one is sent to hell. All who go there send themselves. They're irresistibly drawn there by their nature. After people ascend to the mental realms, their true natures become exposed. This applies to all people, black and non-black. When you are in that state, you can see a person's true nature as plainly as you see the clothes you are wearing. The person's body is deformed in such a way as to expose every part of his or her nature. If the person has a good nature or has learned to be moral, 
the body is transformed accordingly so that you can read, see, smell, hear their true nature simply by being in their presence. That's what compels them to go to that part of the mental realm that's suitable for their nature. So the grossly evil will be among their kind and their environment will reflect their community and they will act accordingly, torturing, maiming, and trying to kill each other for as long as they remain there. Those who survive and receive the light of forgiveness that is constantly cast by their God into these places will be able to depart of their own free will and ascend to better heavens. After a certain period that will seem like an eternity to the inhabitants, but is only 1000 years of earthly time, the hellish realms will be destroyed along with those who remain in them. That's the second death, the final punishment. Now the nature of a person is not something that can be obtained by imitation. It's either their nature or it's not. A tiger cannot become an antelope by imitation even if it eats nothing but grass. It's still a tiger according to its nature. Similarly, black people have become evil by 6,000 years worth of imitation, but that is not our true nature. As soon as the causes and conditions leading to such imitative behavior are removed, black people return to their true nature, which is good. That's what happens in the mental realms. Not only are the physical circumstances leading to evil behavior removed, such as poverty, sickness, et cetera. But psychological factors are also removed, such as vengeance, being slighted, abused, exploited, oppressed, et cetera. All these physical and psychological factors are the handles by which evil latches onto us and causes some of us to commit evil acts, but they are not a part of our nature. Study the old histories of our people and you'll discover that our societies did not have these conditions, including physical ones such as poverty and most diseases. They were introduced into our, community by, uh, by, into our communities by outsiders. In heaven, where such conditions are absent, the causes of evil among black people also become absent and we revert back to our base nature, which is good. So we cannot be compelled to hellish realms by a nature that is not genuinely ours. The opposite is true for non-Blacks. They also revert to their base nature, which is evil. But here is something interesting. Non-Blacks, even though they are evil by nature, do not have to commit evil acts. Nothing compels them to commit these acts. This may sound like a contradiction, but remember, they are a free will people, not animals. Animals cannot resist their true nature, but people can because they have willpower, which animals do not. Even so, the likelihood is that when given half a chance, they'll be evil rather than good, but they don't have to be. That's why there are whites that appear to be moral. They become so by learning the moral behavior of other people. Their second lesson in this was given to them ages ago by Moses, who taught them civility after they had forgotten Yahweh's first teachings. Since then, a small percentage of them have kept a reasonable modicum of civility and moral behavior and made it available to the rest of their races to copy. It's these non-Blacks who will eventually accept the mercy of everlasting life and ascend to Yahweh's endless higher heavens. On the punishment of Black people who dilute our race by marrying non-Blacks, their punishment will come in the form of them losing their lineage of descendants. There will come a time when such not, there will come a time when such light-skinned Blacks are no longer able to procreate as will non-Blacks. Black people, will pride, black people pride themselves in their descendants almost as much as some of us revere our ancestors. To have our line of descendants die out is punishment enough. They will certainly not be sent to hell. Would it not make more sense for whites to just disappear after this cycle? Definitely. That's exactly what will happen. After this 7,000 year period, 6,000 years plus 1,000 years of peace, there will not be a single non-Black left on earth. They will only live in Yahweh's mind, in his heavens. You never ever have to see them again. You are not a part of Yahweh's mind. You are your own God, one of the 1 billion, 8 million. You don't have to see Yahweh's creatures again if you don't want to, just as no one has to see your own creatures either, of which you have many in that part of your mind reserved for them. Now, 
onto the important question of why are we here among the whites? The answer is simply to experience evil. We cannot experience it unless we are here physically. I have stated previously that all other experiences will become our experiences because of our coming divine unity with Yahweh and his soulmate. But that is divine experience. It's not the same as universal experience. The state of divine unity is impossible to describe. It's totally unlike anything known in the universe. It's as different as sound is different from color. Both realities, universal reality and divine reality are necessary for God to complete the creation. So we are here to experience and witness self-forgetfulness firsthand. There's no other way to gain the experience except by actually living it. Let me know if there are some other points still unclear. I know that you have been answering so many questions about so many things. I've been feeling extremely uplifted by your wisdom. I truly anticipate more. I would like to ask you a question. It relates to the recent tragedies in New Orleans and the other torn areas. There are so many black people dying and suffering. Is this one of the ways that are planned for the end of this cycle? Don't know if you have answered this before. Usually during a major tragedy like this in 9-11, as well as many other weather disasters, I often feel like it is near the end of the world. And the only thing that lies ahead is tragedy and despair. But since I have been led to your writings of wisdom, I don't feel as hopeless. I still wonder about life and the future of it as it pertains to black people. You're absolutely right in your feeling that these catastrophes signal the end of the white world. We are in a period of seven years of major catastrophes. It started two years ago with the major earthquake that hit Iran in December, 2003, killing many thousands. That catastrophe signaled the beginning of ever stronger disasters that will occur worldwide. Each one will be stronger than the last in its power to disrupt modern society until all of it finally crumbles. In addition, there will be man-made disasters, wars, and diseases. The next five years are going to see an unprecedented depopulation of the earth. When it's all over, only about one third of the earth's population will be left alive. Unfortunately, many black people are going to suffer in these disasters. Whites deliberately distribute the populations of their cities in such a way that they are able to barricade themselves behind black people in case disaster strikes, forcing them to take the full brunt of it. Using economic pressure, they force black people into areas that are the most vulnerable to natural and man-made disasters. New Orleans is a good example of this. Black people of that city have been forced into the low-lying areas which the city planners knew would be the first to be flooded in case the lake or river burst its banks. Also in every major city all over the world, black people are economically forced into areas surrounded by toxic waste, sewage plants, trash dumps, eroded land, and so on. Thus when disaster strikes, they are most often the first and the worst to suffer. This tragic event in New Orleans and other Gulf areas is a wake up call to all black people who still love and cherish our enemies. It'll force them to ask themselves why it is that when a natural or other kind of major disaster strikes, black people suffer the worst. Even the most progressive assimilation preaching, integration loving blacks will be forced to stop and admit that perhaps there is a deliberate design by white people to put black people in harm's way wherever they can. Not only that, but the lack of pre-planning to provide support is stark and obvious in this case. It was known at least three days in advance where in Louisiana the hurricane would hit and what its strength would be. Engineers also calculated that there was a likelihood of over 75% that lake barriers and levees could not hold back the force of such a powerful hurricane. Yet there was no pre-planning to have dozens of buses standing by ready to evacuate the poor residents who have no other means of transportation. If that city had been 67% white instead of black, you know the planning would have been different. All this points to a lack of caring. Look how sluggish the reaction was. 
This clearly demonstrates these people have absolutely no love for Black people. Today, the hypocrites among them are screaming loud, criticizing as if they care and would have handled the situation better. All they really care about is driving a stake in the hearts of their opponents so they can take over power. They have just as little concern for Black people. They're only interested in upsetting the present powers and taking over. Any person who, any Black person who still has love and sympathy for whites is now being forced to stop and reconsider whether they like it or not. The true nature of these people is being revealed right before our eyes. Even the most blind and deceived among our people cannot help but rethink how the situation really is between us and them. There is a separation coming between us and them. Those among our people who have already seen the light know that such a separation is inevitable. Those who still stubbornly cling to them will be torn away by force of circumstances. Whites are trying to insulate themselves by placing blacks in front of them as their shields. But sooner or later, the disasters will reach them and hit them the hardest. The king of the earth knows what he is doing. When it's all over, they'll all be down on their knees, trembling before his might and glory. Intrigue. What about biracial people? Are they considered black? If so, how is it that it took so many generations to remove the black germ, but only one generation to make it reappear? Also, here you said whites would have to intermarry and their descendants would have to do the same until they became black. So how could a child that has one black parent and one white parent be black? Children of black and white parents are black, as I've stated. And yes, it takes one generation to put the black, to put back the black germ, but seven to remove it. In genetics, as it is in mathematics, seven is the number of completion. The reason it takes only one generation to make a person black again is nature's genetic safety mechanism to guarantee that the black race will never become bleached out of existence. It should not come to us as a surprise that nature favors the black race over all others. We were the first and all firstborns are favored over the rest. Now it takes seven generations to remove it only from purely black people. When the first non-black race was made, their maker started with purely black people as we were the only people on earth then. They bred them lighter and lighter for 200 years or seven generations until the germ was completely removed. Before the complete removal in the seventh, it was progressively weakened for six generations. Those six generation people were still black. They still had the black germ, no matter how attenuated. God incarnated in them because all he or she needs is the slightest presence of it. Such people are in somewhat the same state as albinos. In order for them to successfully complete our ritual education, they have to take part in special rituals designed for them. This makes it hard, almost impossible for them to succeed. So as a general rule, mulattoes and albinos do not take part in, a, in our higher initiations. There have been rare exceptions, one such as Fard Muhammad, a mulatto who underwent severe trials and came out successfully. So it's not impossible, but extremely difficult to the point where death may result. White people who want to be grafted back into the black nation have to go back several generations before their progeny can be fit to take part in our system of education and be considered truly black. To summarize, a biracial child with a black parent is black because he or she has the throne of God for God to incarnate. But to be considered for our system of ritual education, he or she has to be grafted back another three or four generations. Only then is she considered black enough to take part. Those biracials, mulattoes, albinos, et cetera, who die and ascend will have all the non-black blood removed from them. In the mental realms, non-black genes are considered as dross and removed by a spiritual fire, along with all the physical and psychological imperfections, such as deformities and madness, et cetera. They are purified until only their pristine blackness is left in its purity. That becomes the foundation upon which their ritual education begins. I am very intrigued by the things you are saying. Will there be more? Most definitely. 
That's great because you seem to have awakened the truth seeker in me. Your words were the stepping stone I needed to validate the path I am already on. Truth is. P.S. Will you address the melanin issue? Here's a short response I made before on, on melanin in response to a question from another brother. The condition for our in Carnation in a human body is the presence of what is called the black germ. Every black person has two procreative germs or genes. The first is dark and dominant. The second is light and recessive. It's possible to suppress the dark germ such that the light one becomes dominant, in which case a non-black person is born. When this happens accidentally or in a controlled manner, the resulting child is a black albino. Still, such a person has a dark germ, but it's suppressed at conception. It's possible to completely remove the dark germ by selective breeding. It's natural for a black person who is a shade lighter to be born to two purely black parents because of the presence of the recessive light gene. Such people can be selectively bred with each other to produce a whole group of a shade lighter black people. This can be repeated over many generations until the dark gene is completely removed. When this is achieved, the dark gene is not suppressed, but it is completely absent. This genetic situation cannot be reversed except by interbreeding again with black people. This type of genetic removal of the black gene by selective breeding happened 6,000 years ago and resulted in the birth of the first light race. It took exactly seven generations of selective breeding to completely remove the dark germ to make the first light race. Three more races were made in the same way from the first race, the final one being Caucasian. They are the last stage of this type of genetic bleaching. Now in the same way that the ocean bleaches soil and removes its value, turning it into lifeless beach sand and the way sugar is turned valueless by bleaching it white, so too does genetic bleaching remove human value or natural morality. The 1 billion, 8 million gods cannot incarnate in the bodies of the four non-Black races due to this absence of the dark gene, which is a source of what modern scientists call melanin. Melanin is the seat of morality. Without it, God has no throne on which to be seated in the human body. Whenever any person of the non-Black races interbreeds with a Black person, even a sixth generation melanin deficient Black, their child regains the seat of morality or melanin and God can incarnate as ancestral memory in that child. That child is then called black. If that child grows into adulthood and breeds with a non-black, he or she reaches the seventh stage of total melanin absence in the born child and their child is non-black. That's how a black person is defined genetically. Now, ancestral memory on the other hand does not follow biological lineage. It is not handed down from generation to generation. It's a gift of incarnation that enters the child's mind at conception. The gods choose where they incarnate and do not necessarily follow biological lineage. In other words, the original God, you, for example, can incarnate as a black person in England. After that person dies, the same God can then incarnate into a newborn black person in America who is biologically unrelated to the first. The British black person who died is the true ancestor of the newborn American, even though they are biologically unrelated. Thus, all your true ancestors are the previous incarnations of the first self in you, going all the way back to the beginning of the universe. In the case of the non-black races, the incarnating ancestral memory only goes back 6,000 years because they did not exist as a people prior to then. The eternal gods cannot incarnate in them due to the absence of the seat of morality, which is the black germ. Intrigue. I'm finding all this deep black science very interesting. Where are your sources? Also, would you say that science today is backwards or slow? Science today is backwards in more ways than one. It's backward in the sense of slow, but more importantly, it's the opposite of true science in many ways. For, for instance, the entire story of the evolution of people from animals is the opposite of truth. So too are their teachings in many other disciplines. True science is taught in rituals designed for them 
and is related to life. It cannot be learned intellectually as modern scientists try to do. It's a matter of direct experience, as is all true learning. We are taught that to know is to be. In other words, to truly know a thing is to be that thing. This includes so-called abstract concepts of science. Even abstract concepts have a concrete reality when one enters the proper state of mind. Feeling the post 100% as they are. I was not at all surprised that women are chiefs. I was, however, surprised at the phrase, his wife, when they were each other's compliments. Also surprised at God as he. God, or consciousness, created or became manifested she, and he, therefore, cannot have been exclusively he nor she. Otherwise, thank you for aiding us to remember ourselves. Incidentally, what of the Aset or Asar metamorphin in Black Root Science? Is it like the number 144? Also, what of the number nine, a secondary number? 144 is equal to nine, 144,000 is equal to nine, 1 billion, 8 million equals nine. Another thing, are the boy and girl soulmate necessarily born at the same time? I use he for God only for convenience. God is both he and she. In my language, we have only one word, O, oh, for both he and she. It applies to God as he or she is before separating into man and woman. So this is a problem of English and not of our ancient language. The wife and husband part is because they were really married. Married is a sacral eternal institution and the basis for raising children. It has been perverted by the non-Black races, but it's still divine in its original form. Soulmates are not born at exactly the same time. They can be born at about the same time, but mostly they're separated by a few years. Before separation, they exist in a state of divine unity where there is no time. So the few years of separation between their births appears only as a moment to the mate who was born later. The number nine is important in true astrology. Modern astrology is a false science because it takes the birth of a person as the basis for considering planetary alignments. In true astrology, only the alignment that occurs at conception is considered as influential. So nine becomes important as it takes nine months from conception to birth. Therefore, one has to calculate nine months back and study the constellation as it was at that time. But it's not one of the seven primary numbers. Those have to do only with the division of God from one to the multitudes of black people in the earth. As for the legends of Asar and Aset, these and many other such legends are teaching aids. They are mythologies used in mystery schools to teach about activities that took place 6,000 years ago that led to the appearance of the non-black races. I've just been reading some of your teachings on Dusty and after reading it, decided to go to your website to find out more. I have to tell you, I wanted to cry when I found out that the Messiah is a black man with all his angels included. I immediately and felt imbued with renewed and increased strength in myself and pride in my people. It was like visiting the neighborhood I lived in as a child. It all makes so much perfect sense. It all falls into place so neatly. I was brought up a Catholic and I always got the sense that I was hated ever since I was a little child by both clergy and lady alike, who were all white, or as you put it, non-black. Whenever my family turned up for church, the resentment stirring within the congregational flock just beneath the surface was palpable and I was extremely aware of what I recognized as a depressive evil uneasiness inherent in the service. I left the church at the age of 15 against my father's wishes, but I refused to go anymore. I knew something was wrong. I did not feel right to me. I did not belong there. It was like I sensed a grain of truth in the message, but it was obscure and deformed and not meant for me. I have felt the same way with every denomination of the Christian faith that I have briefly adhered to. I felt like an outsider. But when I began to read your teachings, 
the nature and history of the universe, something jumped in me, even before you discuss Black people's place in and outside of it. It was exciting to me and new, yet familiar. I have read about European secret societies, such as the Rosicrucians, the Knights of Malta, etc., and I know that they are behind some, if not all, the atrocities that are occurring and have occurred in Africa, not to mention the theosophical influences of the European elite during the first half of the 20th century that led to a world war. What can I say? It makes all the sense in the world. My heart leaps when I think about it. The Messiah is Black, and not only that, but I, as a Black man, am a brother to him, literally. Please explain, please excuse my long email, but may I ask you a question? Some Black people at times have not behaved in a morally appropriate manner that benefits who or what it is they really are. Myself, I'm not only, I'm only just finding out, I never would have dared to believe that I am, or we all, Black people together are God. As I have said, I have read what you posted thus far on Dusty, and as I understand it, these Black people will be able to redeem themselves through initiation rites and once more achieve full God status or perfection. Am I correct? The reason I ask is you refer to the light-skinned races as inherently evil or in a state of self-forgetfulness. Black people can too and do have Black people can do and have done evil too. I just want to know what the difference is. Again, thank you for sharing your teachings and anything you can say to shed light on the questions that I just asked will be greatly appreciated. My apologies, brother, but can I ask a second question? If there are some among the non-Black people of the earth that know the truth, wouldn't they be doing their utmost to ensure this information does not reach the ears and eyes of Black people? The thought of losing control would drive them insane if they're not already there already. They would do anything to prevent what you describe as having that to happen, including making the planet out of existence if all else failed. Wouldn't you be in some sort of danger or at the very least, wouldn't your information be in danger of being taken offline? Thank you. It's a great pleasure to meet you. I'll answer your second email first. There is indeed the danger you mentioned and others as well that you can imagine, but it's like this, their time is up. They were given 6,000 years to rule the earth. This ended in 1914. Then they were given 100 years of mercy to reform themselves. The vast majority of them have turned their back in pride. What has to happen will happen. There's nothing they can do to stop it. It's now way beyond their means to control it. Stopping me and others who are coming to teach along with me will not do it. The stage is already set and all the powerful players are in position. Now it's just a matter of time. About your first question of whether black people are evil as well, since we too commit crimes, murders and so on. I've been asked this question many times. I'll compile the answer that I gave before to others and send it to you. Hopefully it'll clarify that. These black people will be able to redeem themselves through initiation rites and once more achieve full God status or perfection. Am I correct? That's correct. Thank you for the clarification, brother. What have you, you have said sounds very reasonable to me when I factor in my own personal, predominantly unpleasant experiences with these creatures. My whole life gives authority to what you've said in my mind. Compound that with the historical and contemporary facts of our collective experience and your teachings resonate powerfully with a truth that's hard to objectively deny. Keep up the good work, peace and good health to you. I know your time is precious and you are a busy man, but another question popped into my head while meditating on what I have to read, what I have read on your website so far. Perhaps I should wait a while for all the questions to form in my mind, then send them in one go. But again, that would use up some more of your time. Then again, I'll probably have some more questions after that. 
I am a full African ancestry, but what about when someone is of part African descent? I mean, you say black people together are God. Is there a definition of what exactly constitute a black person in terms of one's level of genetic mixing with the blood of the non-black races? To make myself clearer, do mulattoes qualify as black people or because of their genetic contamination, which they considered are they considered non-Black or the devils? Will they spend eternity working to better their moral character if they so choose, but never achieving perfection in the heavenly realms of Yahweh? Or are they destined for Godhood like Blacks? Or is it a matter of where their individual heads are at? Thank you for your time. Actually, reading some more of your site just now, I've come across the answer to my most recent questions about who is Black. If I have any more questions, I hope I can ask freely without taxing you too much. Feel free, my brother, to ask whenever you have a question. I'm glad you found the answer to your last one. Black Roots. I'm reading your updates at the Geosites site and a couple of questions for you. When you're paying homage, libation, etc., to the ancestors, you're actually summoning your own personalities, not separate beings. How could biological lineage not play a part in the reincarnation of the 1 billion, 8 million? The child would have to be black, right? Is meditation useful to the one of the 1 billion, 8 million in assessing their inner God, in accessing their inner guide? Or is this a tool more useful for the non-blacks? What tools are useful for the 1 billion, 8 million stationed on this plane? How could there really be a concept of sin or evil if the god or goddesses created the light race beings to do exactly what they are doing to the 1 billion, 8 million now? This does not make a lot of sense to me. It's sort of like punishing a dog for barking. If that's a quality that was created as a part of that being, how can that being face justice or suffer for what's being done? Quote, when you're paying homage, libation, etc. end quote, you are summoning your first self. Your first self is responsible for your very existence. It's through him or her that you even exist as a person. The same is true of all other persons that have died, our ancestors. They and you are all personalities of the first self, but the first self is you. Self-forgetfulness or evil for us means forgetting this. The knowledge will again become a reality at the time of divine unity with the original self. So to speak in absolute terms, you are summoning yourself. That is the biggest or highest truth than which there's none higher. When you pray to your biological ancestors, true, they are separate beings and that they are separate gods among the 1 billion, 8 million. But since all the gods live in permanent unity, the result is the same because most people don't know the difference between spiritual and biological ancestors. They go in a roundabout way, focusing on that with which they know. And yes, the child must be black because God incarnates only in black people. Read the question following the section on reincarnation where I answered a similar question. Meditation as described by white people is not the best way to reach the self, although it doesn't do harm if that's the purpose. It's more useful for non-blacks because it was originally designed for people with a group consciousness or a collective as a way to reach the mind of Yahweh and the Elohim. For black people, the technique I described earlier works better as it is personal and direct. Sin or evil, practically speaking, means imbalance. When people commit a sin, they cause an imbalance in nature. To restore it, nature punishes those responsible. In truth, they punish themselves. In their true nature, everybody is aware of the contrast between good and evil. So when a person's true nature is revealed to themselves, as happens in the mental realms, they cannot help but punish themselves for their own sins. Nature overwhelms them in its work of restoring balance. If their evil nature stubbornly stands in the way, natural law destroys them the same way hurricanes destroy those who stand in their path. But in the mental realms, it's not a matter of accidentally being in the way of disaster. It's a question of one's actions being deliberately contrary to natural laws. If such a person refuses to repent 
then he or she is destroyed. If he accepts repentance, then his evil nature will be transformed by education, the same way you can teach a dog not to bark. The fact that we created these people to be evil by nature does not make us responsible for their actions. They have complete free will. Being evil by nature doesn't mean they have to act it out. If that were the case, there wouldn't be a single moral white person. But you know that's not so. Morality can be learned if the person is willing. They are evil by nature because we made them that way, but they do evil acts because they choose to. Unlike animals, they have the willpower to abstain from such evil acts. When they don't, they guarantee their own punishment. Black Roots, something else. You mentioned a series of rights that Blacks use to drastically improve the memories of their griots. Are you at liberty to reveal those particular rights or is that a secret information as well? They are not necessary for simply improving memory. They're used by the griots to relive the experiences and be in that state as they tell them, making it as close to firsthand as possible for those listening. To improve memory, we are trained by the method I explained to you before. Try it. I finally finished reading Black Roots in its entirety. You have done a wonderful job in the simplification of these writings. It is indeed a gift to write about something so sacred, scientific and expansive in truth while delivering it so clearly. Much of your information has served to verify a great many truths which I have been connecting the dots on. Thank you, my sister. <laughs>